Hi friends, we're back. Module four, part two. Let's begin on page 105, third paragraph down, beginning with the sentence that says, the fruiting body of the mushroom. Are we ready? All right, here we go. The fruiting body of the mushroom, of course, is the part that we eat. Although most mushrooms are tasty and nutritious, there are some that are quite toxic. The genus Amanita, for example, contains mushrooms that are commonly called destroying angel mushrooms. These pure white mushrooms carry a poison that is deadly to humans. If you eat one of these mushrooms, it tastes quite normal. However, after eating one of those mushrooms, you can die in as little as 16 hours. There's virtually nothing that can be done to treat a person who has eaten these deadly mushrooms. Since there are rarely distinguishing marks that separate poisonous mushrooms from non-poisonous ones, the only place that you should hunt mushrooms to eat is at the grocery store. <laughs> Many people who try to hunt wild mushrooms end up in a hospital or a coffin because the mushrooms that look tasty are instead toxic. Sometimes you can find mushrooms that grow in an almost perfect circle. See figure 4.6 on the next page. Inside or outside of this ring of mushrooms, no other mushrooms grow. These rings, often called fairy rings, are believed by some to have magical properties because of their unique appearance. Of course, there's no magic associated with a fairy ring. Instead, it is just a result of the saprophytic nature of the fungus. You see, when a fungal mycelium begins to grow in an area, it eats the remains of dead organisms. As it eats, it grows and reproduces. Eventually, the mycelium will spread out in all directions, making a relatively circular patch of hyphae. Once the hyphae in the center of the circle eat up all of the remains of dead organisms, there's no more food for them, and they die. The hyphae at the edge of the mycelium, however, still have food because they haven't existed for as long as those at the center and they therefore have not used up the food in their area. As a result, they continue to live and the mycelium becomes ring-shaped. When it is time to reproduce then, the ring produces fruiting bodies, forming a fairy ring. As time goes on, the mycelium continues to grow outward and the inner hyphae continue to die because they use up their food. As a result, the mycelium can retains its ring shape, but the ring gets larger in diameter. When the reproduction cycle comes again, a new ring of stipes and caps are formed, and this ring is larger than the old one. This happens year after year. Some fairy rings have been found in which the ring of mushrooms is only a few inches wide, but it has a diameter of nearly 20 feet. Other members of Phylum basidiomycota. Phylum basidiomycota is also home to the puffball fungi, middle of figure 4.4. Puff balls, which are saprophytic, produce their spores on basidia inside a membrane rather than in the gills of a cap. When pressure is exerted on the membrane by a passing animal or a heavy wind, the spores are puffed out through the hole through a hole near the top of the puff ball. The spores, which are as fine as dust are often carried on the wind for several miles before they hit the ground. As a result, 
you are unlikely to find dense patches of puffballs. The shelf fungi, right side of figure 4.4, are generally found either on dead wood or on living trees. If you find them on dead wood, they are obviously one of the saprophytic species of shelf fungi, while those found on living trees are the parasitic species. Although parasitic fungi are uncommon, they do exist, and Phylum basidiomycota is home to some of them. The spores of the shelf fungi are formed in the pores of the shelves. These spores are also very fine so that when they are released, they can travel great distances to find another tree on which to grow. Once again, the shelves are just the fruiting bodies of these fungi. The mycelia are inside the wood of the tree. In fact, some parasitic shelf fungi actually add a new layer to the fruiting body each year resulting in huge shelves growing out of the tree trunk. Rusts are another form of fungi that are parasitic. They typically grow on living plants, reducing the plant's ability to grow and mature. If the rust happens to be living on a commercial crop, it can make the crop virtually useless as a source of food. One particularly bothersome form of rust is wheat rust. This fungus is well known for destroying tons of wheat crops over the course of history. Its life cycle is actually rather complex because it requires two hosts, a main host and an alternate host. Both of them are necessary for the rust to complete its life cycle. When wheat rust infects a wheat plant, it produces a red spore called uretospore. These red spores can look like rust, which is how the fungus gets its name. They can travel on the wind to other wheat plants and grow on them, destroying entire fields of wheat. As the wheat season ends, however, the wheat plants turn yellow and the rusts form a different type of spore called teliospore. These spores survive the winter and then grow into basidia in the spring. The basidia produce basidia spores, but those spores cannot grow into fungi on wheat. Instead, they find their way to a barberry bush and grow on the underside of the leaves of this bush. They form tiny cups in which esiospores are, are produced. Esiospores. These spores can then find their way to wheat plants and grow into rust there. The rust then lives most of its life cycle on wheat, its main host. But in the spring, it must depend, or excuse me, in the spring, it must spend a certain part of its life cycle on its alternate host, the barberry bush. One way to protect wheat crop from rust is to eliminate any barberry bushes surrounding the wheat field. Without nearby alternate hosts, the rust will not find it as easy to infect the wheat. The need for an alternate host is rather common among parasitic fungi. Smuts are another group of parasitic fungi that belong in Phylum basidiomycota. These fungi also feed on crops such as wheat, barley, rye, and corn, resulting in millions of dollars worth of crop loss each year. Typically, Farmers cannot control smuts or rust chemically because anything that kills the fungi also kills the plants upon which they live. Instead, agricultural scientists try to develop strains of wheat, barley, rye, and corn that are resistant to these fungi. Many advances have been made in such crop-related research, and as a result, 
the crops planted today are less likely, but not immune, to be ruined by fungi. To finish our study of phylum Basidiomycota, perform the following experiment. Although this lab calls for a microscope, you can really perform all of the steps with just a magnifying glass. You won't see quite as much, but you will still learn a lot. Phylum Ascomycota. <coughs> Excuse me. The members of Phylum Ascomycota are both single-celled creatures and multicellular organisms. They're generically referred to as sac fungi because they form their spores in protective membranes, sacs, shaped like globes, flasks, or dishes. These sacs are called asci, and the spores inside are called ascospores. The single-celled members of this phylum are generally called yeasts. The yeast that we use in cooking is an example of a single-celled member of phylum Ascomacota. Yeasts. Since yeasts are probably the most well-known members of phylum Ascomacota, we will begin there. Most yeasts are saprophytic, although there are examples of parasitic yeasts as well. When forming spores, they reproduce sexually, producing ascospores. Most yeasts, however, have a form of asexual reproduction called budding at their disposal as well. When a yeast buds, the nucleus of the cell reproduces inside a single cell. A section of the cell wall and plasma membrane then swell to form a pouch into which the nucleus and some cytoplasm flow. This pouch with its nucleus is called a bud. The bud continues to grow until it is about the same size as the parent cell and then the two cells separate. Budding is distinct from the asexual reproduction with which you are already familiar such as that of the bacteria studied in module number two. Because the daughter cell remains attached to the parent cell as it grows. Yeasts are typically egg-shaped cells that are only somewhat larger than bacteria. Besides a nucleus, about the only organelle in a yeast cell is a vacuole that stores food substances and certain chemicals that the yeast needs. Certain species of yeast store substances useful to humans in these vacuoles. For example, there are many species of yeast that tend to store vitamins in their vacuoles. Some people eat these yeasts in a ground up, powdered form to obtain the vitamins. The yeast with which you are most familiar, however, is the type used in baking. Active dry baker's yeast that you can buy at the grocery store contains Saccharomyces. Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Cerevisiae. Let's say that again. Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Vasei spores. That's a mouthful, huh? When mixed with water, these spores mature into yeast cells that can carry on a process called fermentation. Fermentation, the anaerobic breakdown of sugars into smaller molecules. Fermentation is responsible for making bread dough rise. The yeast mixed with the bread dough feed on the sugars in the bread, breaking them down into alcohol and carbon dioxide. Since carbon dioxide is a gas, it pushes its way out of the dough, causing the dough to rise. When the dough is put in the oven, the yeasts are killed and the alcohol evaporates. In fact, the nice smell that you associate with baking bread is a mixture of two things, alcohol and another substance called ozone. In large quantities, 
ozone is poisonous to humans. In small quantities, however, it simply has a distinct odor. When bread is in the oven, the heat causes the alcohol made by the yeast to evaporate. The alcohol, as it evaporates, can chemically react with other substances in the air to make ozone. The mixture of ozone and alcohol in the air makes the unique smell that we associate with bread baking. Yeasts are also used in the manufacture of alcoholic beverages such as beer and wine. Since one of the products of fermentation is alcohol, yeasts are used to put the alcohol into the alcoholic beverages. Yeasts feed on the sugars in hops, a plant, and barley to perform the fermentation process in the manufacture of beer. In the manufacture of wine, they feed off of sugars in the grapes or other fruits that are used to make the wine. Interestingly enough, yeast cannot survive high concentrations of alcohol. Thus, as they continue the fermentation process, the increasing amount of alcohol actually ends up killing them. Wild forms of yeast can only stand a 4% level of alcohol before they begin to die off. Wineries and breweries, however, have bred strains of yeast that can survive levels of up to 12%. A mixture of wild yeast and specially bred yeast is used in the making of most alcoholic beverages. Alcoholic drinks such as whiskey that have levels of alcohol much greater than 12% are made by taking a drink with 12% alcohol and boiling it. When a mixture of alcohol and water is boiled, the alcohol boils off at a lower temperature than the water. If you collect the vapors produced by boiling at this lower temperature and condense them, the result is a solution with a higher concentration of alcohol. This process is called distillation. Learn more about yeast by performing the follow exp following experiment. Despite the fact that the supplies call for a microscope, the first five steps in the procedure should be done, even if you don't have a microscope and the related equipment. Performing these steps will allow you to observe the fermentation process. Other members of Phylum Ascomycota. Many of the tasty edible fungi also belong in Phylum Ascomycota. Morels, whose fruiting bodies look like sponges, are one of the most sought after forms of edible fungus. A morel is shown in the middle of figure 4.7. The ascospores of these fungi are formed within the holes that make up the sponge-like fruiting body. Wind and rain release the spores, allowing them to travel. Once again, however, just because a fungus looks like a sponge, it is not necessarily edible. Many amateur fungus hunters have been tricked into eating toxic fungi because the fruiting body happened to look like a sponge. Cup fungi, on the left in figure 4.7, whose fruiting bodies look like small cups, form their ascospores on the inside of the cup. When raindrops hit the cup, the force of impact releases the ascospores. Many of the fungi that cause disease are in this phylum as well. Claviaceps, purpurpia, better known as air gut of rye can be deadly to humans. As its popular name implies, it feeds on rye grain. If rye bread made with rye that has claviceps, or I'm sorry, uh, clavi claviceps, claviceps purpurea, 
let me read that again. If rye bread made with rye that has Claviceps purpurea in it is eaten, it is often deadly. History tells us that Peter the Great was thwarted in his efforts to conquer the known world because his troops were fed rye bread that contained this fungus. In addition, many historians believe that the calamities that plagued the early settlers in New England were caused by rye that contained Claviceps purpurea. Unfortunately, the settlers at that time had no idea about this fungus, so they blamed it on witches and started the famous Salem witch trials in colonial Massachusetts. Have you heard about Dutch elm disease? What about chestnut blight? Both of these diseases caused by fungi in phylum Ascomycota affect trees. The American chestnut was once one, was once one of the most important sources of hardwood lumber in the United States. The fungus that causes chestnut blight, Cryphonectria, tri, Cryphonectria parasitica. Ooh, let's start that one again. The fungus that causes chestnut blight. Cryphonectria parasitica spread so quickly across the United States, however, that the American chestnut was completely wiped out. Likewise, many regions have lost their elm trees due to the fungus that causes Dutch elm disease. Ophiostoma omi. Ophiostoma omi. Wow, these Latin nomenclatures are fun to say, aren't they? Tongue twisters. Phylum Zygomycota. The next phylum we want to discuss contains those fungi that form zygospores. Zygospore. A zygote surrounded by a hard protective covering. Of course, this definition does little good if you don't know what a zygote is. We will discuss or study this in detail later. However, for right now, think of it this way. A zygote forms as a result of sexual reproduction when each parent contributes only half of the DNA necessary to form the offspring. When those two halves join together, a full set of DNA is formed and the offspring can begin development. Zygote, the result of sexual reproduction when each parent contributes half of the DNA necessary for the offspring. If this definition confuses you, don't worry about it. When we cover reproduction in detail, you will understand it much better. For right now, just think of a zygote as a certain product of sexual reproduction. Later, we will learn much more about what this product is and how it is different from other products of reproduction. You've probably had some experience with at least a few of the members of this phylum. For example, the mold that grows on old bread is a member of phylum zygomycota. Because the members of this phylum have a variety of reproduction methods at their disposal, it is useful to study an example of their life cycle in detail. Begin by examining figure 4.8, an illustration of the bread mold's life cycle. As you can see from the figure, there are three ways that these molds can reproduce. They can asexually reproduce when a stolen lengthens and forms new filaments. The new filaments become a new mycelium and thus a new fungus. Another form of asexual reproduction involves the production of sporangia from aerial hyphae that release spores. Finally, hyphae can fuse together and sexually reproduce to form a zygospore that can then mature into another fungus. Although the latter form of reproduction is what separates these fungi from the ones in the other phyla, 
all three means of reproduction are used. The, well, the most well-known members of this phylum come from genus Rhizopus, which contains most of the common bread molds. Because these fungi, fungi have so many reproductive modes at their disposal, their spores are in the air virtually everywhere. If you leave bread out in the open, bread mold spores will eventually land on it. And within a matter of days, the growing mold will be noticeable. Most molds that grow on bread and other baked goods are harmless if consumed in small quantities. The molds that grow on fruit are typically members of this phylum as well. To become more familiar with these organisms, perform experiment 4.3. Although this experiment calls for a microscope, you can perform the first two steps with just a magnifying glass. Thus, you should perform this experiment even if you do not have a microscope. Phylum Chytridiomycota. Phylum Chytridiomycota contains the single celled fungi called chytrids. Chytrids inhabit, inhabit muddy or aquatic areas. They are typically saprophytic feeding on decaying water plants. Some species of chytrids, however, are parasitic. One well-known parasitic chytrid is Synchytrium endobioticum. Synchytrium endobioticum, which causes potato wart. This fungus has been responsible for destroying many potato crops over the year. Over the years. However, most commercial potatoes grown today are resistant to this fungus. The characteristic that sets the members of this phylum apart from the rest of the fungi is the fact that their spores have flagella. Remember that the spores of the other fungi must be carried by wind or some other method in order to be dispersed because they cannot move on their own. The spores of the fungi in this phylum, however, need no help in being dispersed as they can use their flagella to move on their own. Phylum Deuteromycota, the imperfect fungi. If a fungus is studied and scientists cannot determine a sexual reproductive phase in its life cycle, it is placed in this phylum until it can be better classified. The reason we put phylum in quest quotation marks here is that many biologists don't really consider this classification group a true phylum. Instead, they consider it a holding area until more can be learned about the fungus. Many biologists think that every fungus has a phase of sexual reproduction. Since some fungi are rather hard to study in detail, however, there are some whose mode of sexual reproduction eludes us. As a result, we place them in this phylum until the sexual reproduction method can be found. Once that happens, the fungus can be placed in one of the other phyla in kingdom fungi. Because we don't really under we don't fully understand the fungi in this phylum, we often call them imperfect fungi. Since many biologists consider this classification group a temporary holding area, they often say that this phylum has no taxonomic status. Remember, taxonomy is the science of classification. This statement then is equivalent to saying that phylum deuteromycota does not really exist. It is simply a place for us to stick fungi that are not yet fully understood. We can't overemphasize, however, that the reason this classification has no taxonomic status is because biologists assume 
that all fungi have a sexual mode of reproduction. This, of course, could very well be an incorrect assumption. And perhaps this should be a true phylum. The fact that some of the fungi in this group have been extensively studied for many years without finding a sexual mode of reproduction might be considered strong evidence that the assumption is indeed wrong. <laughs> One of the most useful imperfect fungi comes from the genus penicillium. These fungi produce the drug penicillin. In 1928, Alexander Fleming, an English physician, discovered this wonderful drug quite by accident. He had taken a short vacation, leaving a bacteria culture open to the air. When he returned, he saw that the culture was overrun by bacteria, except in a certain place where a blue mold from the genus Penicillium was forming. The blue mold seemed to be producing a substance that killed the bacteria. Fleming isolated that chemical and called it penicillin. With the help of two other scientists, he demonstrated that this substance can kill bacteria associated with many human sicknesses. Thus, the first antibiotic was discovered antibiotic, a chemical secreted by a living organism that kills or reduces the reproduction rate of other organisms. Because penicillin and other antibiotics have been so successful in treating many forms of sickness, these three scientists shared the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1945.